So, uh, good morning. Actually, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you uh, for the invitation, Anna. It's uh, great to be back uh, in campus uh, and visit uh, our home. Um, my journey uh, started in 2003, 11 years ago, uh, when I, was attended, uh, I attended the first uh, art conference. Uh, the first day was in Chrysler, and the second day was here in uh, North Campus at the Aero uh, Building. Um, I, it was my first semester. I came to Michigan. I started in Michigan in winter uh, with, a, with a snow and everything. Um, um, and after I, I bought the long shacks, uh, uh, then I was started looking for an, an interesting topic to, to, to do my, my dissertation. And, and I had various ideas, and I was proposing uh, different uh, ideas to my advisors, uh, Dennis Asanis and Panos Papalambros. And some of them ideas uh, sounded really Greek uh, to them, uh, partially because I was speaking Greek. <laughs> uh, and, and, um, and then I read this article uh, discussing about the discrepancy between true fuel economy and fuel economy uh, posted on, on the winter sticker. And, and when I discussed that with my advisors, they, they thought that that could be an interesting problem to deep dive. So let me first take some time to introduce the problem, then I'm going to go through the proposed solution, and then I'm going to be talking about what I'm, what I'm, what I'm working on today. So when we, engine operation is characterized by the pair of engine torque and engine speed. And as we drive the vehicle, essentially, uh, we have this engine operating point jumping around. A and these contours are the brake-specific fuel consumption contours, the BASFC contours, and we have also uh, contours for emissions. Now, how we create these contours? When with engine calibration, essentially we take the whole operating domain, we discretize it with a finite, usually small number of steady state operating points, then we operate the engine under these operating points and we start uh, finding the optimal values of various controllable variables, ejection timing, variable, variable geometry, turbocharging, EGR, and so forth. Then we take all these values, maps, and we pass them th to integrate into the electronic control unit of the engine. So as we drive the vehicle and going through these different engine operating points, we interpolate these values and we uh, you know, uh, operate the engine robust. Now, at that time, we had some studies in Autolab, and we, we uh, um, uh, investigated the, the transient engine operation. And we've noticed that uh, transient operation is path dependent. So if you operate the engine in a given operating point at steady state, and you have a given uh, fuel consumption, uh, if, we are, if you approach this operating point from two different directions, then fuel consumption is associated with different values. So essentially, there is a small transient period where, um, uh, which is path dependent. A and this is why when we drive on a highway, we get true fuel economy, because we operate the engine uh, at steady state operation, which has been calibrated for. Although when we drive in city, we operate the engine during this transient period, and we interpolate values of steady state operating points. And we cannot really capture a uh, transient operation. So, how to address this problem? To uh, optimize for all these transient cases a priori, it's invisible because there are infinite n different numbers of transients. So the idea was to develop the framework and algorithms that can make the engine learn uh, the driver's driving style and derive an optimal calibration with respect to the driver's driving style. So essentially, we learn the sequences <coughs> of engine operating point transitions and we derive uh, optimal calibration for these uh, sequences. Let's visualize this. Uh, instead of now of, of interpolating values of, uh, corresponding to steady state operating points, we learn the sequence of engine operating point transitions corresponding to the driver's driving style, and then we derive the optimal calibration for this particular uh, transition. And, and how do we do that? Well, we model mathematically uh, this, the, engine, the evolution of engine operation as a control mark of chain, and essentially we solved a, a stochastic control uh, problem. Then we, we did various case studies, and we presented those uh, in, in different uh, uh, conferences 
uh, uh, here in the ARC. And we've noticed that there is significant room to improve both fuel economy and emissions uh, by, uh, by doing this uh, exercise. Uh, this is a particular example with a diesel engine when we try to uh, optimize with respect to ejection timing and the variable geometry uh, turbocharger. Uh, a few months ago, I've learned that the University of Michigan um, awarded the patent on that, and I'm sure the technology transfer office would be happy to discuss with you about opportunities for licensing and so forth. <laughs> so uh, I graduated in 2008, and then um, I went to General Motors to work on similar and relevant problems for two and a half years. And then uh, uh, I've been with Oak Ridge National Lab for the last uh, three and a half years. Uh, more recently, I was asked to um, help on um, establishing a, a new institute which tries to uh, understand the interactions between uh, the human dynamics and, and the infrastructure. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be spending a little bit of time to show you what's my current research and what I'm, I'm currently, uh, uh, um, uh, what currently keep me busy. So essentially, uh, uh, nowadays I'm trying to understand complex systems for applications related to energy and transportation. When you're looking at a... If you can mute. So... Um, what are complex systems? In order to understand complex systems, we might want to look at the nature. Uh, if we see a school of fish or a flock of birds, essentially we, we see the behavior of a system consisting of uh, interactive entities. And systems that uh, unexpected patterns uh, emerges as a result of these interactions are named uh, uh, complex system. And a great place to find complex systems is in our living world. Uh, in an effort to improve our life, quality of life, we have created complex systems in transportation, um, energy power systems, uh, smart grid. Our political system is complex, uh, financial markets. In all these cases, we have the interaction of individual um, uh, entities, and then we have an emergent phenomenon, an emergent, an emergent pattern from this interaction. So uh, the study of complex systems has been recently recognized as a new type of science. According to Scott Page, a professor of political science and economics here at the University of Michigan, uh, complex systems exhibit four attributes. Uh, they are diverse, they are connected, they are interdependent both in space and time, and also they are adaptive. Um, let's see, for example, the financial market. We have uh, banks, firms, traders, and they are all connected to some sort of network. Uh, they are also interdependent. Uh, the, the way one bank behaves affects the behavior of another bank. And they are also adaptive. McDonald's put uh, salads in their menus as a result of a changing environment. Uh, complex systems produce also large events. If you have a dramatic decline of stock price for a sequence of days, you may end up with a stock crash, stock market crash. Uh, one, emerge, one significant property of complex systems are the emergent phenomena uh, that occur. And what we observe on the macro level differs significantly from what we see on a micro level. Uh, for example, our brain is a complex system consisting of billions of neurons that are connecting and disconnecting through different chemical and, 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 and uh, electrical pathways to create various functions of the brain, like intelligence, learning, consciousness. All these functions are results of the emergent phenomenon. And also complex systems produce dynamics, like, for example, phase transitions. We call it tipping points. A tipping point is when the system reaches a, a given um, a threshold, after which the whole state of the system changes significantly. So, in order to understand complex systems, we need to address two questions. First, what's the interaction between the entities? And, and then, what is the mechanism that uh, uh, produces an emergent phenomenon based on this interaction? Um, if you look at the flock of birds, for example, you, you, you may think that there is a bird acting as a leader that sends messages to other birds where to fly. As a matter of fact, the, the, the birds follow three rules. Uh, first. Uh, stay close, but don't bump into birds around me. Uh, fly as fast as birds near me. 
and a uh, fly move towards the center of the group. Following these simple rules, they have this emergent phenomenon like you saw earlier on uh, of, in the flock of birds. Here's another complex system. You can see that we disturb the system with the milk, and then the rule is pushed into one direction. <laughs> and this is the emergent phenomenon. So the idea is how you can simplify complex systems in order to understand them. So as you see, there are emergent phenomena, and the, and the important so, thing. It's so good to, to start with people. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, there is no centralized planner for this emergent phenomenon. Uh, of course, we can find other um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, cases in our living world, like the Merchant Band, that you have a centralized planner who assigns precisely a specific moves for each individual, uh, uh, and we have these patterns. And if we look at the nature, we have amazing, beautiful patterns. So the question is what we can learn from the nature and apply it to our complex systems in our living world, especially in transportation, energy, um, power systems, and so forth. So essentially, this is my current research and what I've been working on uh, for the last few years. Uh, I'm interested in understanding complex systems. And the hypothesis is that we can reverse this mechanism of the bottom-up emergence and be able to identify the rules on a micro level so that to have a, a desired emergent phenomenon. And what are the applications? Transportation. In order to address this problem, we need to understand the, the interactions on the micro level, on the vehicle level, and then how these interactions can emerge in, in a smooth uh, traffic without stop and go driving, without uh, idling engine operation. Uh, if we do that, the improvement in fuel economy and, reduction, and emission reduction would be significantly. One particular case study that we are currently uh, looking at is how we can coordinate the vehicles in, in this type of scenarios when we have multiple lanes merging into a small number of lanes. In this case, everybody block each other. And, uh, but we can uh, you know, uh, use our understanding in complex theory and, and coordinate this vehicle in a decentralized uh, way. So we have uh, a new concept. We call it iVehicle, which essentially assumes that we have connected vehicle technologies, and the vehicles can communicate with each other, can communicate with infrastructure, and they can exchange information in a way to coordinate with each other, to avoid uh, congestion. The vision of this idea is so the, the vehicles can exchange information with infrastructure. They pass this information to the driver, and we assume that the driver will follow up these instructions. We can, of course, provide incentive for this matter or penalize the driver, reinforce to follow up these instructions by sending him a, a, a ticket, electronic ticket, into his email address. <laughs> so uh, with this, uh, I'm an ARC product. I, I would like for this matter to thank you all especially the R community uh, for the financial and technical support. My advisors, Denis Asanis and Panos Papalabros, for being so patient. I've got a lot from them, not the Greek accent. I had the Greek accent before. <laughs> and uh, all my colleagues uh, in uh, Autolab and uh, ODE, uh, we, are, we have a big network. We're still in touch with many of them, and we communicate, we, uh, with, we collaborate. Um, of course, I want to acknowledge the, um, uh, uh, the financial support of the LDRD program of Oak Ridge National Lab that gives me the opportunity to do basic research. And then, of course, the Vehicle Technologies Office that uh, gives me the opportunity to use the results of this basic research and uh, apply to real uh, 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 works case. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. We need is given a like, 10 months time period. By me alone, I can only do very, very small part of it. But we set, set up a, a very effective